Dawkins goes on to quote some obscure and unnamed Christians who attack Einstein's view of God. Who are these people? Dawkins doesn't even tell us their names. Does Dawkins really expect us to believe that they represent mainstream Christianity? One particularly glaring example is a quote from a letter from some president of a historical society in New Jersey, who says, as, as everyone knows, religion is based on faith, not knowledge. I am sure Dawkins must have searched long and hard to find such an off-the-wall quote. Does this idea really exist within the pages of Christianity's scriptures? The Bible actually tells believers to test everything. In his revelation to Isaiah, God himself stated, Come now, and let us reason together. God, the creator of humans and human reasoning ability wants us to use that ability. Psalm 19 tells us that the universe declares the glory of God, and that this voice goes out into all the earth. In fact, the Bible says that the evidence for God's design of the universe is so strong, that people are without excuse in rejecting God and his plan of salvation. The Bible says that God created humans, and endowed them with a mind so that they would use it. The Bible says that God and Jesus Christ will test the minds as well as the hearts of people. One of the most important prophecies for Christianity, the coming of the New Covenant, fulfilled in the coming of the Messiah, Jesus of Nazareth, describes the changes God does in both the heart and the mind of those who are transformed. The Bible says that those who do not believe do so, in part, because of deception in their minds. This deception leads to hostility to God, and defiling of their minds and consciences. The Christian is encouraged to direct our mind to know, to investigate, and to seek wisdom and an explanation. Christians should use their minds in all aspects of life, and always be prepared to give an answer to everyone, who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. Many verses from Proverbs discuss the importance of acquiring knowledge and wisdom, even to the degree of choosing knowledge over riches. Faith is of utmost importance to the Christian, but the Bible doesn't say to limit your belief to faith alone. In fact, it commands us to add first moral excellence then second knowledge. The Bible encourages believers to have a knowledge-based faith, built upon sound biblical doctrine. When Paul preached the gospel, he did it through reasoning from the scriptures and not an appeal to blind faith. In fact, he commended the Bereans, because they examined the prophecies to determine, if what he was saying was the truth. Paul, in his letters to the churches told believers to do away with childish thinking and reasoning. Christians are advised to set an example for others in teaching by modeling integrity, seriousness, and soundness of speech. Jesus, in one of his most famous quotes said, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your mind. Blind faith is never taught in the Bible. Dawkins' response to the letter from some president of a historical society in New Jersey is, What a devastatingly revealing letter. Every sentence drips with intellectual and moral cowardice. However, only really naive atheists are going to believe that some unnamed president of a historical society in New Jersey really represents what Christianity teaches about faith and reason. How does Dawkins really think he is going to get away with such deception? As everyone knows, religion is based on faith, not knowledge. Every thinking person, perhaps, is assailed at times with religious doubt. My own faith has wavered many a time but I never told anyone of my spiritual aberrations for two reasons. One, I feared that I might by mere suggestion disturb and damage the life and hopes of some fellow being. Two, because I agree with the writer who said, there is a mean streak in anyone who will destroy another's faith. I hope, Dr. Einstein, that you were misquoted and that you will yet say something more pleasing to the vast number of the American people who delight to do you honor. Here's a continuation of Dawkins' poisoning the well strategy. A couple of letters are supposed to illustrate the weakness of the religious mind, to use Dawkins' phrase, and what does the first of these letters tell us? If we meet up with someone who claims to believe in God, we are to mistrust them, because they are actually being insincere. Kind of insidious, isn't it?
If we were one of those people who too easily jump to conclusions given the skimpiest available evidence, the conclusion we would jump to here is that no one who professes a genuine religious belief can be trusted. I believe in Spinoza's God, who reveals himself in the orderly harmony of what exists, not in a God who concerns himself with fates and actions of human beings. Now, here's an interesting contradiction. In this quote, Einstein states that he believes in Spinoza's God, that is to say, he's a pantheist. But contrast this with Einstein's earlier quote that he's a non-believer, that is to say, an atheist. So, which is it? That Einstein actually believes in Spinoza's God or that he doesn't? Well, if Einstein actually did believe in Spinoza's God and there's no reason not to take him at his word, he's certainly no atheist. Let's remind ourselves of the terminology. A theist believes in a supernatural intelligence who, in addition to his main work of creating the universe in the first place, is still around to oversee and influence the subsequent fate of his initial creation. In many theistic belief systems, the deity is intimately involved in human affairs. He answers prayers, forgives or punishes sins, intervenes in the world by performing miracles, frets about good and bad deeds, and knows when we do them or even think of doing them. A deist, too, believes in a supernatural intelligence, but one whose activities were confined to setting up the laws that govern the universe in the first place. The deist god never intervenes thereafter, and certainly has no specific interest in human affairs. Pantheists don't believe in a supernatural god at all, but use the word god as a non-supernatural synonym for nature, or for the universe, or for the lawfulness that governs its workings. Deists differ from theists in that their God does not answer prayers, is not interested in sins or confessions, does not read our thoughts, and does not intervene with capricious miracles. Deists differ from pantheists in that the deist God is some kind of cosmic intelligence, rather than the pantheist's metaphoric or poetic synonym for the laws of the universe. Pantheism is sexed-up atheism. Deism is watered-down theism. This paragraph tells us that it's important to make a distinction between theism, deism, and pantheism, and it is important. Since many of the remarks that Dawkins will later make attacking theism will not necessarily apply to deism or pantheism. Unfortunately, while it's important to understand differing views of God, this paragraph does not adequately describe the pantheistic view. Pantheism is much more than sexed-up atheism, as Dawkins describes it. The term pantheism is derived from the Greek pan, which means all, and theos, which means God. So pantheism is the belief that God is all, or, alternatively, all is God. That's a whole lot different from atheism. In fact, it's exact opposite. So where is Dawkins coming from? Well, within pantheism, there are four distinct varieties, the first being classical pantheism, which believes in a personal and omniscient God, a God with a mind whose body is the universe. The primary analogy given by the classical pantheists is that we are to God as individual blood cells are to the body as a whole. If individual blood cells were found to have an individual consciousness, that would by no means imply that the body in which they are found would be without consciousness. And while the individual cells may not understand the mechanism by which the larger body has consciousness, that does not mean that there would be no such consciousness. Classical pantheism is clearly opposed to the Dawkins definition. The next type of pantheism is naturalistic pantheism, which believes in an unconscious universe identical with God, in which case God would have a body, but not a mind. This is the variety of pantheism that Dawkins defines as pantheism, but it is only one of the varieties, and even so, it is still different from atheism. The third type of pantheism is panentheism, which is the idea that the universe is part of God, but ultimately the mind and body are separate. Finally, there is pandeism, which holds that the universe is identical to God, but unconscious, although in a previous incarnation, God designed and created the universe, which he ultimately became. Only one of these four varieties of pantheism is even remotely related to atheism, and even that is a stretch. But, as we will see going forward, Dawkins needs to account for the numerous scientists who believe in God, scientists few of us would consider delusional, so Dawkins is going to label them as pantheists, and then will insist that pantheism is nothing more than atheism, 
when in fact that is manifestly not the case. 